uh, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Corey Hogebaum from um, Cedar sinai in Los Angeles, who will, I think, take us into the animal models of uh, senescence. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today to present to you. I appreciate this opportunity from PFF to, to come and present uh, some of our work today. I'm going to briefly touch on uh, some of the work uh, that we and others have embarked upon in trying to understand the overall significance of senescence in the context of, of IPF and, and focus really on trying to understand uh, what is was happening, particularly in animal models, but also in the context of some of the in vitro models that we, we often use in this field. We've heard that cellular senescence is a feature of age-related diseases, and not, not to belabor the point, this aging process does lead to uh, a number of discernible changes that can be seen uh, on many levels, from genomic to pro proteomic to metabolomic. But the bottom line is that uh, these universal aging traits that are shown here, including uh, impaired wound healing, all the way down to poor vision, which I'm suffering from right now, uh, uh, can really lead to some very severe and important uh, age-related diseases, of which uh, we're going to focus on IPF, obviously. And I would really state for this audience that there has been an explosion in experimental and clinical investigation uh, into the consequences of cellular senescence in IPF. And I'll just point out some fantastic reviews that, that, have, that have been um, presented by some very talented physician scientists and investigators in this field. And just to pull from uh, this particular review that Anna Mora and her colleagues uh, put out just recently, uh, they state that aging is a major risk factor for IPF and age-related cell perturbations such as telomere attrition, senescence, epigenetic drift. Uh, all of these factors then are, are coalescing then and form uh, what are viewed as being very important targets in IPF therapy. And indeed, we've seen this uh, uh, explosion, if you will, in the form of, of some very high-profile papers, some of which I've highlighted here, and I encourage you to get these slides and to, to make note of these particular papers, where we've seen in, in a very short time where experimental data around targeting senescent cells has now moved into the clinic, uh, cl quite literally at the, at the Mayo Clinic, exploring how uh, approaches directed towards uh, senescent cells uh, might be beneficial in the context of IPF. So I'm boring uh, some single cell data that's not quite as elegant or as beautifully colored as what we saw this morning, but suffice it to say, there is evidence of cellular senescence in both normal and fibrotic lungs, as we've heard already. And uh, really, it's the senescent signal, in this case defined by the presence of uh, GLB-1, or senescence-associated beta-galactosidase, in both ILD and normal cells, so you have to look for the brown staining. And uh, more, I think, clearly, we see that when we look across the spectrum of severity in pulmonary fibrosis, there's, there's clearly a preponderance then of a number of markers of cellular senescence, including P16 staining. But really, what's driving work in my laboratory now is really trying to understand the mechanisms that are driving cellular senescence. And, and you know, clearly we've heard a lot about uh, some of the, the environmental factors that are key in uh, driving these perturbations. But if we focus on the epithelial cells we heard Melanie elegantly describe, we know that these factors then are impinging upon uh, these epithelial cell types within the lung. And the consequence thereof is uh, some type of a senescent phenotype that impacts then uh, the fibrotic or wound healing process. If we drill a little bit deeper, not to get into the particulars uh, too thoroughly, we, we see uh, obviously these effects on, on telomere uh, shortening, but we also see changes in oncogene and uh, oxidative stress, something we really haven't talked uh, at length about yet. But, you know, the downstream consequences of telomere shortening, I think, are the best described to date if we look into the experimental literature. And what we've learned in the mouse is that uh, uh, perturbations to the lengths of telomeres or the function of telomeres, whether we're talking about uh, targeting specific transcriptases, 
or other types of binding factors uh, such as TRF1, there are profound consequences then for altering the ability of these factors then to uh, uh, work in the lung. And even in, in the absence of, of TRF1, there is uh, a, a spontaneous fibrosis that begins to occur in these mice as they age. So the, the, there is no need for an injury stimulus such as that provided by bleomycin sulfate. And clearly the uh, uh, telomere attrition then is leading to DNA damage and this is a vicious cycle. Just so that you know, you're really leading to activation of pathways that are furthering oxidative stress in the context of this senescent cell, and that in turn is leading to uh, alterations in telomere length and so on and so forth. Now, as I mentioned, we're interested in mechanisms, and we've uh, begun to uh, drill down on uh, these environmental factors, if you will. Uh, and uh, what we've been attracted by, as you heard from uh, Dr. Nath's talk today, is really trying to understand some of these aberrant host defense mechanisms in mesenchymal cells and how there might be an interface then between uh, host defense and cellular senescence. And indeed, if we look at a very simplified overview in terms of how cells sense uh, the presence of DNA, uh, and in this case, the DNA is, lack, is lacking methylation sites. And as a result of lacking these methylation sites, it's uniquely identified by very specific receptors that are localized in a wide variety of different cell types, not only immune cells. And in this setting then, uh, DNA then can evoke uh, a number of events that lead to uh, hopefully immune activation, that is to uh, activate the immune system to uh, deal with a pathogen such as a virus that the cell's been exposed to. But we've also learned that there are other mechanisms that are involved uh, around this DNA sensing phenomenon. So that free DNA that's simply floating in the milieu can actually be processed by not only immune cells but other uh, cells in, in the uh, environment to then lead to uh, consequences that are clearly not beneficial from the standpoint of host defense, but indeed can lead to uh, alterations in uh, wound healing responses. So uh, I'm just highlighting work here from Glenda Trujillo and her collaboration with Natali Kaminsky and Erica Herzog at Yale, in which in, they found that extracellular mitochondrial DNA is generated by fibroblasts and as such then was predictive of, of death in, in IPF patients. So we've gone on to explore this a little bit more fully using essentially synthetic versions of hypomethylated DNA called CPG DNA. And, and uh, Miriam Holman and Yago Sa in my lab then have begun to explore how this particular DNA signal can alter the behavior of fibroblasts that we derive from uh, IPF patients. And one thing that we, we saw very early on, a number of years ago, in fact, was that hypomethylate DNA drives the activation of genes such as smooth muscle actin, therefore driving these cells into a myofibroblast phenotype. But what we've been surprised to learn of late is that now in a subset of these cells, uh, we find that there is activation of markers of senescence. And indeed, I'm not cherry-picking uh, senescence markers at this point. We've done a more uh, global analysis of uh, particular markers, uh, some are even biomarkers of cellular senescence in these primary IPF fibroblasts in culture, and have found that indeed there is a marked upregulation in the expression of these markers of senescence, not only with the use of synthetic hypomethylate DNA such as CPG, but also mitochondrial DNA and other forms of DNA that we obtain, either from proliferating cells or uh, senescent cells. So what we know at this point is that, yes, CPG DNA promotes fibroblast, myofibroblast differentiation, but what has been really, I think, frustrating for us to this point is the classic DNA sensing mechanisms that we're very familiar with from the uh, immune literature uh, doesn't seem to be involved in this process. So neither TLR9 or Sting seem to be involved in driving cellular senescence, at least in a primary lung fibroblast from IPF patients. So our, our active quest at this point is trying to understand uh, what DNA sensor is responsible for this, and as you can imagine, this might be a very valuable target in the context of a disease like IPF. 
Now, in the remaining time I have, I'm just going to focus on targeting cell senescence and disease. And, and really, I think we're on the cusp of uh, a, a major change in the way that we view IPF and uh, therapeutic targeting with IPF. Now, you know, there's really two camps in terms of how to deal with senescent cells. One involves uh, the panel on the, the top right there, in which we're trying to attenuate uh, the communication networks that senescent cells have set up. That is the soluble mediators these cells are making. Quite frankly, this is a whack-a-mole experiment, as we've learned that uh, targeting one of these pathways really seems to lead to another pathway compensating and, and so on and so forth. It really is uh, a very uh, difficult way to attenuate uh, the activity of senescent cells, at least it has been to date. So most of the attention then is, has really been trying to coax these senescent cells into programmed cell death using uh, various types of pro-apoptotic uh, uh, factors. So in our studies at Cedars-Sinai Medical Center, we've been looking almost exclusively at fibroblasts and comparing and contrasting normal and IPF fibroblasts in vitro. And what we see, regardless of the uh, speed at which the disease progressed in IPF patients, uh, so I'm referring to stable versus rapid IPF, we find a preponderance of cells that are in that senescent mode based upon their expression of secretory uh, or senescence-associated beta-galactosidase. And this is after a very short time in culture, a relatively short time in culture, where in normal cultures we, we find uh, very few of these senescent cells, but indeed in these IPF cultures we do. So what Miriam did was actually take all of these uh, three uh, cell types, normal, rapid, and, and uh, slow IPF, and drive them in, through replicative senescence into a state where we knew that all of the cells in the culture were senescent, and then she looked at whether these cells were then susceptible to extrinsic pro-apoptotic signals in the form of either FAS or uh, trail ligand. So these are two very potent pro-apoptotic. So these, these ligands kill normal cells quite effectively, as you can see. Uh, but really, the IPF cells are impervious to the presence of these uh, extrinsic pro-apoptotic factors. Now, there were some obvious explanations for this uh, resistance uh, to uh, the pro-apoptotic factors, and that was that the IPF cells simply weren't expressing the receptors necessary to respond to these ligands. So really, the, the, the question at this point became, how can we restore sensitivity of these senescent cells to pro-apoptotic signals such as FAS and TRAIL? And this is where we landed on quercetin. You know, so as we began these studies, the literature was beginning to emerge that the cell had senolytic activity. Uh, so we, we explored this in the context of the in vitro system I just showed you, but also in the context of a mouse model involving bleomycin-induced lung injury. Now, it's important to note that uh, quercetin actually works better as an antifibrotic agent when one looks at bleomycin-induced pulmonary injury in an aged mouse. So I think that we as a community of IPF researchers are beginning to realize that the way in which we're using our models maybe needs to be rethunk. And that is that if we're going to look at a disease that predominantly affects aged individuals, we really need to use the appropriate models that are aged. And, and I'll get off my soapbox now. What we, have saw, well, what we saw in this study was that uh, there was a profound effect then on the remodeling due to bleomycin in this model when quercetin was added uh, to these animals beginning at day seven after the bleomycin challenge. Now, uh, I don't have sufficient time to, to really delve into the mechanism, but just to summarize a lot of data in, in, in a few slides here, what we note in senescent IPF fibroblasts is that there is a, a loss of of FAS and uh, the trail receptors DR4 and DR5. This is associated with a loss of a major uh, regulatory scaffolding type protein in these cells called caviolin-1 and a corresponding increase in the phosphorylation of AKT. Both of these then, and probably other mechanisms as well, coalesce to prevent these cells from responding to proapoptotic signals and the accumulation of these senescent fibroblasts then leads to progressive fibrosis. 
Now, in the presence of quercetin, and this was seen both in vitro and in vivo, uh, we saw that uh, quercetin in particular upregulated fast expression on senescent IPF fibroblasts and had effects, uh, we're not sure how they're tied in, but uh, suffice it to say there were changes in the expression of caviolin 1 as well as a loss of, of, of phosphorylated AKT. Most importantly, when fast ligand and trail then were applied to these cells, we saw that there was the induction of, of apoptosis and attenuated fibrosis. Now, looking back, and uh, what Stephanie Garcia has been doing is, is trying to understand uh, whether standard of care medications such as an intentative and preventidome promote apoptosis uh, in senescent normal and IPF fibroblasts. Uh, we find that indeed nintenative does, at least in vitro, it's comparable to the effects of a, of a fast ligand uh, uh, that we've worked with, whereas profenadone does not. Now just a note of caution though, and, and granted these are cell in a dish type studies, uh, what we have noted is that it doesn't appear that the cell death that's being driven by uh, either nintenative or any of the, the combination of, of drugs that I'm showing you here, uh, is silent, and that is we're not simply driving the apoptosis of these cells, but indeed we are seeing evidence that it's a driving uh, phenomenon known as necroptosis and pyroptosis. The significance of this isn't clear at this point, but obviously when, it, when a cell is dying and it's bursting and it's releasing everything within it, um, that could have some, some downstream consequences. And indeed, if we look at the impact of, of profenadone and intentative in patients who've been treated, and this is work out of UCSF, uh, Paul Walters, uh, we see that uh, neither of these drugs is really uh, affecting uh, the numbers or at least the presence of, of senescent cells in uh, lung biopsies. And then finally, uh, work to date has really focused on novel markers, and this is where we really need to go back to the to, to, to basic research and begin to understand those markers that are relevant to cellular senescence in IPF. I don't believe that we can look at, at general cellular senescent markers, uh, but what we need to do is focus on IPF in particular. And there are some uh, unique markers, uh, both associated with the cell surface, as well as secreted markers that we think will be significant in helping us to understand uh, the uh, uh, what is happening in terms of cellular senescence, and more particularly, how are our, our therapeutics working in this disease? So as I mentioned, cellular senescence is a prominent feature in IPF. There are several mechanisms that account for cellular senescence in IPF. We've seen the, the benefits of cellular senescence uh, uh, in studies that I wasn't able to address today through a resting invasive cell uh, lung fibroblasts. But I would say that those benefits are um, really limited if we look at all the consequences of cellular senescence. And it's really the use of senolytic interventions then that are beginning to provide us some important clues as to uh, how this could be used therapeutically. And really our future challenge is how best to target cellular senescence uh, in the context of IPF. I've acknowledged the wonderful investigators I have the privilege of working with at Cedar sinai uh, There's some other uh, collaborators that are listed on this slide as well. This work is certainly possible through uh, funding uh, from the NIH as well as uh, industry partners and, and Cedar sinai So thank you, and uh, uh, I guess we'll wait for questions. <laughs>